Hi, and welcome once again to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. I'm Matthew Dylitz, Editor-in-Chief of the Science of Psychotherapy. And as always, I'm here with the wonderful Richard Hill. Howdy, Richard. Oh, look, very nice to call me wonderful, because uh, that's, of course, <laughs> curiosity and wonder is my favorite thing. But uh, uh, here we are doing these these wonderful uh, uh, examinations and discussions with the people who are at the Holistic Recovery Summit. Yes. And uh, we've got a very, very special guest today. In fact, he's one of our best friends that we've made over the years. And uh, now just tell us a little bit about our good friend, Ollie. Yes, it's Dr. Oliver Morgan. Richard, we've had Dr. Oliver Morgan on our uh, show a number of times, and uh, he's written in a magazine a number of times, and he talks about addiction as an attachment disorder. Um, but he's going to take it even further today as we talk to him about what he's covering in the summit. Yeah, I'm very excited because he's got something. He, he's, he's, he's growing beyond his book. So uh, yeah. let's go and talk to uh, Ollie and uh, really enjoy what, we, what he's got to say to us. If you're interested in deepening your understanding of addiction and how best to treat it, you might want to check out the Holistic Recovery Summit. This is a free online conference which brings together 35 world-leading clinical psychologists, researchers and practitioners who will share with you their best practices for mind, body, social and spiritual approaches to addiction treatment enabling you to be at the forefront of evidence-based care. With a lineup including Stephen Porges, Janina Fisher, Ian McGilchrist, Pat Ogden, Anna Lemke, Stephen Hayes, Richard Schwartz, and 28 others, this really is a once-in-a-lifetime learning opportunity. The best bit is it's 100% free to attend live, and you can do so from the comfort of home. You'll also be able to upgrade to your recordings and certification pass after registration, although this is entirely optional. For more information, please check out the sign up link in the description. Dr. Oliver Morgan, welcome back to the Science of Psychotherapy. It's great to see you again. It's great to be back. It's good to see you too, Matthew and Richard. Yes, I'm, I'm here too. And of course, we'll we'll bring it back to we'll bring it back to where we are. G'day, Ollie. Uh, it's, we, we've, done a, we've, we've talked a lot and we've really enjoyed your stuff and people will know you from uh, the science of psychotherapy i'm sure uh mm -hmm. and uh on on the 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 podcast we've done and also in the academy but um and we were so excited that um that you were included in the holistic uh, recovery summit i think niall has made uh, uh, excellent choices and uh, but so we wanted to catch up with you we wanted to catch up with some of the stuff you were saying uh on the summit and uh, you know if there's any news or things over the last uh, five or six months that that you want to catch us up on uh and we figured that i you know i'd just say that and and then we'd say go uh and and away you'd away you'd go, Ali. Just so let us know what was what was uh, what's going on with this one. What are you bringing out? Uh, uh, are you trying to bring out in this particular presentation at the summit? Well, it's it's mostly a review of the book, but my own thinking from there has gone a bit further. Um, I am really captivated by the notion of social ecology. And what that adds to the brain disease model. The, you know, the some people I think interpreted what I wrote as um, saying the disease model is dead. The disease model of addiction. And I don't think that at all. I think I think science always um, questions its paradigms and looks forward to new ways of conceptualizing things that enhance the models. Um, so I, I, to build on the brain disease model, uh, I started to talk in the book about social ecology. And, and I've learned a lot about that, mostly from Bruce Perry. You, yeah. guys, you guys know Bruce, right? Well, well, I just quickly put in there while you're talking. Uh, one of my master's degrees is, uh, or two of them actually, in social ecology, uh, broadly social ecology, and also the educational framework of social ecology. So, uh, and Matt and I have talked about this uh, uh, rather extensively. So, this is very interesting. I'm really keen to hear what you've got to say. 
Yeah, well, I uh, when I started, I got into it because I started reading Murray Bookshin mm -hmm. and a number of other people who were talking about the environment around us. And rather than thinking about the vulnerability to addiction coming from inside the brain, although I think that's important to acknowledge, I think what, what many of us haven't paid attention to is that the vulnerability also comes from inside our culture. And that the toxicities that are in our culture really set, um, set our stress levels much higher than they ought to be so that when things happen to us, we, re we react out of a hyper, um, a hyper stress reaction. So addiction for me is more and more becoming a way of adapting to that hyper stress in my life. And that comes from the culture. I, I, I got really interested in that. Um, interestingly enough, because of the gun debate in the United States. Hmm. And as I was, as I've watched us struggle unsuccessfully with gun control and what's happening with guns and listening to the political arguments where people are saying, you know, this is a mental health problem that um, people getting shot and all this stuff is really a mental health problem. And if we just focused on that, everything will be fine. And I kept having this voice in the back of my head that said, no, it's not just a mental health problem. It's a social health. Yeah. And and it's that we, thing of a mental health problem about what? Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're having a mental health response to uh, to something that is disquieting. And and, and so please uh, back to you about the, this social uh, disquiet. Yeah. The, the, the social problem is the toxic culture, I think. Hmm. Um, and so in the United States, anyway, I don't know about Australia, but in the United States, we, we have a culture awash in guns that is already toxic and the guns make people's popping off, make people's stress responses. They have automatic reactions and they have automatic consequences. So that if I don't like you, I'll shoot you. Or if I don't like what you're saying, we're going, right, Richard and Matthew, we're going through that right now with um, so many people being shot. Um, how do I put this? Because of, because of the political climate, judges are being shot. Prosecutors are being shot. The, the whole civilized, civilized part of our society is being taken down and focusing on the guns is not the issue. We have to focus on the toxicity. And, 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 so we, the, and the, yeah, I just think the guns yeah. are reflective of what the toxic culture is doing, which is, which is fast action, fast problem, fast resolution. Uh, right. And, and don't talk our way out of it. Just act. Act without yeah. any reflection, without any, consideration of what's going on it, in many ways our our gun situation in the united states is very similar to what i said about addiction in the united states which is it's the canary in the coal mine it's letting us know that the culture is a mess and that's what we really have to work with and, and work on um and that's what that's why the vulnerabilities are so important to pay attention to um with addiction you know we we have ways of trying to deal with um brain systems that are out of whack and we have ways of dealing with psychological systems that are out of whack but we don't none of it has worked none of it has really lessened the addiction problem we have and, and my my plea for this is that we that we focus on on the culture on what's going on underneath all that that really sets us up um, to have addictive cycles and to have guns that are out of whack and to have a social system that is um, 
not conducive to health. The other thing that I've been thinking about in this connection, I don't know if you know this, either one of you. Um, I was a Jesuit priest for 32 years. Oh. And one of the people that I met when I was in the Jesuits was uh, Ignacio Martin Barro from El Salvador. He was killed in, in, in El Salvador. And Martin Barro was, was the one among that group that was a social science psychologist. And he talked about, not surprisingly, he talked about elements in Salvadoran culture that were anti-human. And he talked about the need for the society to move towards humanization and to, and to not demonize people not demonize the military, not demonize poor, if you're on the conservative side of things, but really to see and value each human being as a person. We are not in that position, in that place right now. We think of the way we talk about addicts. Mm -hmm. And 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 the way we we talk about many other problems in our in, in our society anyway. And there's a kind of an anti-humanistic, anti-person stance that people find so easy to take. And once you once you dehumanize people, it is much easier to treat them as just addicts we can throw away, or people we can shoot, or people with whom we disagree as the enemy. And that so that's I, I know it sounds like a bit of a jumble. But that's really where I, where my head has been in the last number of months. Yeah, that that's that's fantastic because we are all in this melee of yeah. this cultural stress. And I, I've written down here adaptation or maybe reaction to toxic cultural stress. Um, so, as therapists working with individuals, how do we? Because we're not you know, we're not the president of the United States or we're not in places of power to, you <laughs> right. know, to radically right. change the the culture. Um, how do we address this to the individual in front we, of us? We do have, well, by helping the, indi um, how do I put this? The We have to deal with the individual mm -hmm. for sure. But we also have a place with systems. As, as mental health professionals, we have a we have a voice in in adapting and changing the systems that we are part of. So for example, at the University of Scranton, where I which I just retired from, thanks be to God, <laughs> the, we have tried for a long time to put in place not just a good counseling center for the students who are struggling with drugs or the students who are struggling with depression or the but we've struggled to put into place dormitory living situations in which students with like-minded problems can receive a more systemic kind of response so um drug-free dorms is one thing that a number of places in the United States have been experimenting with. I think Rutgers in New Jersey has several of them. Um, Drug-free high schools, mental health oriented high schools so that students who are trying to cope with suicidality and other kinds of things don't just get mental health, they get groups and other kinds of programs that give them a sense of meaning and purpose and value so that they don't need to think about am i worthwhile am i what am i going to do and uh, you know in that in that regard i i'm aware of so many particularly young adults adolescents and young adults who feel devalued by the society we live in you know, I, I, most of our suicidality in our teenagers and young adults comes from a lack of purpose and a lack of being understood, a lack of being seen for who they are, which is why it attacks the gay and lesbian and bisexual communities so powerfully. Um, 
And I think if we can have systems that like high, sc high schools, college dormitories, other kinds of venues in which we communicate to people that the internet is a powerful way to inter intervene here, I think, where we can send out messages that you are important, you have value, your decisions make a difference. And I, and I think that's, it's one of the things that I think is really important for us to pay attention to. I don't know if you guys have seen, um, okay, I'm going to go here. I don't know if you've seen, uh, uh, there are two now, two seasons of a television show that's very popular with teens and young adults here and, and older adults, interestingly enough, called Heartstopper. No. It is it is enormously powerful, particularly for it's it's geared towards gay, lesbian, bisexual, uh, trans people, and it it talks about the value of community, building communities around them, and the value of finding meaning in one's life, and I think that's that's the kind of systemic intervention that I'm thinking of. Now that's a TV show that's having an enormous impact on people mm. yes it, it's um, so interesting ollie the because I've, I've been having the good fortune with some other work that i'm doing to just be re-looking at the different sort of uh, movements of thinking uh and sort of in psychotherapy we, we sort of had a sort of a psychodynamic a psychoanalytical uh, sort of uh, uh right and wrong type of process we had a just behaviorism like it's just what you do mm -hmm. what you don't do and this humanism which um is still arguable what maslow was saying but this then the humanistic yeah that's right but the humanistic like looking at the whole person the holism the uh existentialism some of these ideas that have been now percolating around for about 40 50 years and it's almost like this feels like a um uh, a, a sort of a kickback or a or a a, a reaction uh, there's a there's an element of of um there seems to be an element of dystopian desire uh it, sort of we prefer things to be in a way that most people can't make it because that gives me a better chance of of succeeding and what well, you know what i call the winner loser world you know where where mm -hmm. i'm a winner and everybody else is a loser and it's, um, you know, when you think of Viktor Frankl coming out with his work, you know, The Man's Search for Meaning, it's almost like uh, there's this diffracted um, kickback against meaning, which, of course, heightens, because as you say, these things, what we're doing is we're, we're reintroducing meaning as being useful, but gosh, how did it become unuseful? How did it get pushed out uh, of the frame? Uh, and and addiction seems to be you know going to something that just is nice to me and does what i want and mm -hmm. does it when i want it seems to be such it a it does what i want it does it on command yeah and and it appears at least in the beginning not to have any drawbacks the drawbacks come later yeah so it, so addiction works and 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 you know, it drugs works it satisfies that sense of attachment too, which you have spoken a lot about in oh, the past. Here. Yes. Yeah. The other, the other thing I would, I would point out is that there's, um, there, there's a, a fella in England, David Best. I don't know if you know, David, um, who has championed over there a number of, a number of ways in which if, if leaders in in a in the culture, and he's pointing to several places in Europe and, and, and in England, where they've stopped a lot of the more thuggish kind of police-oriented approach to addiction. The courts, they've educated judges and they've educated the police and other people so that the mo the money that gets all that money that gets poured into the the judicial system, the police system, the a lot of the private mental health system really gets reoriented into, into programs and interventions that help people feel more useful. It connects them to a job. 
it connects them to living situations that are safer than the ones they're in and it connects them it connects them back to to the to the society in which they live so that they have a reason to get out of bed in the morning hmm. and that it appears it, when you look at the data on those kinds of programs it appears that that's having a real effect in the in the lives of groups of people um so i i'm really interested in that as well uh, so i think rather than thinking of my interventions now as working with an addict one a person who's struggling with addiction one on one um i'm trying to think more and more how do i connect the, the power of connection right how do i connect them to maybe not maybe they burned a lot of friendship bridges behind them but how do i connect them to us to a meaningful contribution to sus to society yeah yeah and again that, and that so, keyword connection yeah and mm -hmm. just, I, I matt as your good question of how do we deal with the the one person in front of us and what you're saying is by dealing with the one person in front of us in this more social framework that one person could very well uh, that work you're doing with one person generates out with 10 20 30 who knows how many uh yeah yes yes when i and I've st i'm still doing some consulting with some of the treatment centers in our in our area here in pennsylvania and what i keep trying to uh, get them to do is to not stay hidden in the in the uh the countryside but get involved in what's happening in the, in the cities in the in the in the in the counties and sponsoring more things so that their good work becomes more visible and then their work becoming more visible um that can really help individuals i think the same is true you know for a long time this is this was considered heresy but for, for a long time AA cups kept saying, "Oh, you know, we can't can't do anything really public because that's really much too dangerous." And anonymity is a major principle. Yes, it is anonymity for the individual, mm. but that doesn't mean that AA groups can't be involved in county programs in trying to get things more visible for people. Um, so I, that's another area that I'm really interested in. Yeah, fantastic. Well, looking forward to hearing a lot more from you uh, at the summit. And uh, so, I hope so. So, glad, yeah. so glad you're part of the mix there, um, our, our good mate Ollie. Uh, so, <laughs> so very excited that you're part of that. And um, just thank you for dropping. I was into shocked that. to be part of it, to be honest. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 no, don't be like that no but 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 so interesting this work and uh, what you're teasing out uh even in with with more more openness here today with us and uh uh and and so fascinating that that's that's what you're talking about is a central feature of 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 what uh, you know matt and i have been doing it's it's really framing uh, uh creating a new frame of we have to think more broadly we have to think beneath just the the superficial or the 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 emergent properties of uh, of what's going on and look to to the 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 maelstrom that's going on underneath mm. uh, yes. and uh so well, thanks so much yes. for spending some time with us today ollie and and we hope everybody tunes into yours and everybody else's presentation uh later on this year i hope so too the other person that i've learned a lot from who's also on that first day of the summit is Bruce Alexander. Okay. Ah, yes. Yep. And and he, he's been my, I call him my mentor from afar. Ah. We've well, never met, well, but we've corresponded brilliant. a good bit. And I got some of this from him. Wonderful cross, cross, cross fertilization there. Mm. And, uh, yeah. but it is. I love, I love English and Australian people and Canadians with accents. <laughs> oh, we do for us. we do the See, best from my point can. of view you have an accent from your <laughs> point of view i don't know what you think of my bastardized english but <laughs> uh look we're just happy with santa claus with an american accent <laughs> there you go <laughs> for now ollie we'll have to say goodbye but thank you so much okay. for giving us your time
Thanks, You're Ollie. welcome. Thanks very much. Wow, Ollie's talking about social ecology. Yes. Uh, that's what I spent years uh, in studying. It's a little bit different in America. Uh, they're yeah. a little bit more uh, uh, functional and pragmatic about it. Mm. Uh, um, uh, Australia is a little bit more phenomenological, a bit more yep. experiential. But yep. um, but the same framework of getting back to what's the cultural frameworks going on? What What's the cultural environment? Oh, really interesting. Yeah. Oh, I can't Love wait it. to hear his talk. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, look, click on the link below um, and uh, check out the Holistic Recovery Summit. Um, it's well worth, it's it's a free event, um, well worth your time. Lots of amazing speakers, including Ollie and uh, Richard and I, we're certainly going to be checking it out. It's going to be great. Absolutely. So for now, we'll see you for the next time. Okay. Catch you then. Bye-bye.